Grace, mercy, and peace is yours from the tribune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Tim. I'm back for a second try. This is a very forgiving church. You make mistakes the first time, but they still let you come back again for another try. Thank you for choosing to spend part of your weekend with us. WPC is a faith community of people from many stages of life with, who imperfectly seek to love God, love our neighbors, and make a difference in this world. From near and far, long-serving and first-timers, we enter into this sacred space and time together because we want to see Jesus. Share the good news. All, all are welcome in this place. May we come drawn by grace and challenge, ready to worship God and follow in his faith. Our worship has already begun. So let's join together as we sing, pray, and listen for God's voice. have come at Christ's own bidding to this high and holy place where we wait with hope and longing for some token of God's grace. <clears throat> Here we pray for new assurance that our faith is not in vain. Searching like those first disciples for a sign both clear and plain. Children of God, welcome home. Welcome to worship here at Westminster Presbyterian Church in this season of Lent. In this season of Lent, we are spending time paying attention to the words of Jesus Christ from the cross. And today, we are going to encounter his words, I am thirsty. And so as we continue in worship, let us head in that direction of hearing those words of Jesus and what he has to say to us today in those very words. And as we continue in worship, let us join together in prayer. Holy God, by the cross and resurrection of Jesus, you lift the suffering world toward hope and transformation, and you open the way to eternal salvation and eternal life. As we move ever closer to the cross of Jesus Christ, may your law of love be written on our hearts as he draws all people to himself, revealing your love for the world. Amen and amen. You may now stand as we join together in our opening songs of praise.
You may be seated. Let us pray for the cleansing of our hearts, confessing our sins to the one whose mercy is everlasting. Please join me in today's prayer of humility. We want to we see want you, to see Jesus, you. but sometimes we are too afraid, afraid to ask for help. help. We, we want, want to see you, but we aren't sure if those should be allowed, should be allowed to, come to come too. too. We, we want, want to see you, but we, but don't, we don't love the way you talk about sacrifice and death or about outcasts and sinners. We want to see you, but we also want to know how you'll go first. Forgive us, fill us with courage to stand and seek, with openness to those around us, with vision to see your big picture, with the trust to follow you in Christ's name for his sake. Hear us now as we, as we offer, offer you our silent, silent confession. Confession. 
Our God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, loves you as you are. In the name of Jesus Christ, and by his authority alone, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. Believe the good news of the gospel. In, In Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ we, we are, are forgiven. forgiven. On this day, the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Please turn to your neighbors and extend the peace of Christ to those around you. And then you may be seated. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of the Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Today's Bible reading is from uh, John chapter 19, verses 28 and 29. When Jesus knew that all was not finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar of, full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. May the Lord add a, a blessing to the reading, hearing, and our living of his holy scripture. Well, good morning. Good morning. See, we're the younger members of our church. See some over there. How are we doing today? Thumbs up over there. Let's see. Any in the balcony? Of course, thumbs down. In the <laughs> Again, you can't have thumbs down and be smiling at the same time. Just thumbs to the side up there. How are we doing back there, over there on this side? We're doing well? Thumbs up from the baby. All right. Nelson, we're calling your, you're pushing your luck here. <laughs> the front row, the thumbs to the side from the pastor's kid. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Well, well let's see. I want to see if we can uh, remember a little bit from last Sunday. If you were here last Sunday, let's see if we can remember. We me last Sunday, we talked about Jesus, and there was something in our Bible reading that Jesus did. I don't know if you can remember what Jesus did. Do you remember what he did? If you were here last Sunday, do you remember? Jesus cried. He cried. Then if you were, if you were here last Sunday, do you remember that? Raise your hand. Do you remember that? Yeah, Bill, Bill Wade remembers. That's good. Just testing the memory here. We, Jesus cried. And we talked about that sometimes life is difficult and sometimes we get sad sometimes we cry and Jesus gives us permission to do that and it's also nice to know that Jesus sometimes cried well today Jesus said something else he on the cross today he says I am thirsty I am thirsty now when you're thirsty 
If you're at home and you say, I'm thirsty, what do you, what do you usually get to drink? What do you like to drink? I hear adults say water. Any kids saying water? You like to drink water? Good for you. Anybody grab a bottle of water? When you're really thirsty, isn't it nice to grab some water? What else do you like to drink? Mountain Dew. Literally wearing a Mountain Dew sweatshirt today. What do you like? Carrot juice. Oh, pear juice. I was going to say carrot juice. Oh. Anybody in the balcony, what do you like to drink when you're thirsty? Any? And no carrot juice, I hope, up there. No. But we're, when we're thirsty, we get a, sometimes we get some water or some juice or something to drink. And when you're really thirsty and you take a drink, doesn't it, feel, it really feels good, doesn't it? You know, it's nice to know, I think, today that Jesus got thirsty once. Helps us remember that he, in many ways, was like us. That he felt things. That, that he, last week, he, he was sad. He cried. This week, he's thirsty. I think it's important for us to remember that Jesus was, in many ways, like us. He was a human. He, he felt things. He got sad. He got thirsty. It's important to remember that. He was a human being. He came to with, but even more than that, he also introduced us to who God is, that God has come to be with us in Jesus. So next time you go home, you grab a bottle of water, or you're thirsty, you say, I am thirsty. I want you to remember that Jesus also got thirsty. Let's figure out what that means for our lives, that Jesus does that. All right, friends, thank you so much for being here today. Let's put our hands up. We put our hands up. We're going to pray together. Mr. Mountain Dew hoodie, put our hands up here. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your son Jesus who came to be with us. We thank you that, that he cried. And today we remember that he was thirsty. Help us to understand what those words mean for our lives and our relationship with Jesus. Amen. And amen.
In this series of sermons, we have been listening to Jesus' final words as he died on the cross. Four weeks ago, Jesus gave us a message of forgiveness. Three weeks ago, he gave us a message of hope. Two weeks ago, he brought us into a new family, this family that we now call the church. And last week, Jesus cried words of lament, and he gave us permission to lean into our own pain through the words of the Psalms of lament. Now, with these final statements of Jesus that we've been thinking about together, we've been trying to understand the significance and the meaning of these last words of Jesus from the cross. And so we've been asking questions like, you know, why would Jesus have said this? Or why did the gospel writer include this phrase of Jesus? Why did he record this? Maybe most importantly, what does it mean for us that Jesus would have left us with these particular words as he was dying on the cross? So, with those questions, we now come to today. We come to the fifth statement of Jesus from the cross. And he says, I am thirsty. It's a simple statement. It is not really unexpected. You would expect someone in this situation to say something like that. I am thirsty as they hung for hours in pain on the cross under the heat of the sun. You know, it would have been difficult for anyone, for any victim of crucifixion to say any words out loud in those moments. So we should hold in high regard any word that Jesus said. And so what is the significance for us today of, of Jesus saying, I am thirsty? Could it be that there's a deeper meaning, a deeper significance than what is apparent on the surface? Let's pray. Holy God, on this day, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Jesus says, I am thirsty. In response, someone takes a stick, they attach a sponge to it, they dip the sponge in sour wine and offer Jesus a drink. Sour wine was, it was cheap wine. It was wine that was consumed by the poor. It was known for its bitter, vinegary taste. Yet if you were thirsty... I imagine even this bitter wine would be better than nothing. You know, in today's reading from the Gospel of John, the writer explains that Jesus spoke these words, I am thirsty, in order to fulfill the Scripture. Now, people who are smarter than I think that Jesus in this moment is referencing another psalm, just like he referenced a psalm when he said, when he lamented, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's also referencing a psalm today, Psalm 69, verse 21, which reads, For my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Chances are good that Jesus was saying in these words, Look, what I am doing now was written down centuries ago. It is part of God's plan that was set in motion long before today. And if that's the case, it seems that there is a bit of a deeper meaning that the Gospel of John is pointing us toward in the telling of this part of the story. It could be that when Jesus says, I'm thirsty, he's seeking something more than just water for our lives. 
Now, the first thing I think we're reminded of in this scene, or we should be thinking about when we think through this scene, is the the humanity of Jesus. Let's start there. You see, nearly everyone who has been with a dying loved one knows that if the person is still conscious when they're approaching death, he or she becomes thirsty. I'm sure some of you have have lived through this. You're in the hospital and typically a nurse or a hospice worker or a loved one will grab uh, these little sponges and they're attached to a stick. And you kind of soak it in some water and then you stick it in the person's mouth and sometimes you just sort of rub it up against their cheeks or their tongue so that the person can sort of draw some water into their mouth as a way of relief or comfort. That's exactly what was taking place in this story with Jesus, except they used a stick and a sponge. And that's the scene at a most basic level. But it's an important scene for us because here's the point, at least the the initial point that John was trying to make He was reminding us as the readers of the gospel, as the hearer of these words, that Jesus was fully human in this moment. John wants to remind us that before his death, he thirsted as we thirst. That he also subsequently died as we will die. And this was an important point for John because even as he wrote his gospel, There was a popular cultural belief that Jesus was only a spirit who appeared to be human. There were people who didn't believe that the Son of God would ever come to earth and take on flesh and blood and then ever be defeated by evil. And he would certainly never actually suffer on the cross and die for us humans. So at a most basic level, John, in retelling this part of the crucifixion of Jesus, in writing that Jesus said, I am thirsty, Jesus is saying to those who will forever read his gospel, I stood by the cross. I saw Jesus suffer. I heard him cry out, I am thirsty. He was not merely the spirit who was pretending to be suffering and dying. He was a flesh and blood human being dying there on the cross. And that's important. We can't minimize what John is saying there. By way of sort of a personal confession, I recognize that Jesus is... Savior and Lord of my life. And because of that, if, if there's sort of a bit of a hierarchical scale, I recognize that Jesus is way better than me in all things. And as a result, I sometimes have a difficult time trying to relate with Jesus. As I read through the gospel stories about Jesus, I confess at some points there's a bit of a disconnect trying to get into the mind of Jesus. Sure, I know that he loves me. I've been told that he cares about me. Every time I celebrate communion, I know that I am somehow eating and drinking in communion with the crucified and risen Jesus. I know that Jesus wants to be with me. But I also know that Jesus is totally better than me. And that makes it just a little bit difficult relating to him. And then we get to John chapter 19. And Jesus is on the cross and he says, I am thirsty. And I read these words and I think to myself, I know what that feels like. I don't know what it's like to be the Savior of the world dying on a cross, but I certainly know what it feels like to be thirsty. 
And if even for that moment, maybe if only for that moment, I'm able to believe that Jesus understands what it's like to be a human being, what it's like to be thirsty. So that's a meaning. One of the ways that we can understand the words of Jesus today when he says, I'm thirsty. But I want to go a little deeper today. There's a couple other things going on in this phrase from Jesus. You know, when he says, I am thirsty, if you've read through the gospel stories of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, you might remember that there are moments in which Jesus uses the metaphor of drinking to describe the suffering that he would endure in his life. He uses this image to describe the suffering. He says that he will drink. He does this in Matthew chapter 20, in Matthew chapter 26, in John chapter 18. He says, are you able to sort of drink the cup that I am going to drink? It's a way of Jesus sort of talking about his own suffering that he's going to endure. You know, it could be that Jesus' words on the cross were pointing to his willingness to drink the cup of suffering, to drink the cup of sin and hate and evil and death, and drink from that cup all the way down to the bottom of it until the suffering and evil and hate and sin has been consumed by him in their entirety. It could also be that Jesus' thirst in this moment was an indicator that he had finished drinking from the cup, that his work was done, that he had completed his mission of suffering and dying so that the world could be saved through him. But even still, I think there's some more to this story for us. And I think it's found in the Gospel of John. If we, if we sort of go back in time to chapters 4 and chapter 7 of his Gospel. Because in chapter 4 of John, we read a fascinating story. It's a story that many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. We read in, in chapter 4 of this story in which Jesus says, for the only other time in his ministry, I am thirsty. And so when we hear those words from the cross, we should be sort of sent back to that story to think about what happened there. Because as the story goes in the Gospel of John chapter 4, Jesus encounters a woman who's by herself at a well. She's likely been despised and rejected by the other community members, which is why she's by herself. And Jesus, being thirsty, asks her for a drink. And then he says to her these famous lines. If you recognized God's gift and who is saying to you, give me some water to drink, you would be asking him and he would give you living water. And you would never thirst again. You see, in this encounter, Jesus opens the eyes of this woman to recognize that she is thirsty for more than just water on the day that she arrived at that well. And when Jesus uses this metaphor of thirst and living water, he speaks of that which is essential for our lives. We need physical water, but we also need this living water to which he is speaking. This spiritual water is what our hearts crave. Things like joy and hope, meaning and purpose, companionship and love, forgiveness and mercy. Jesus is saying to this woman in this story, who has been trying to find this living water her whole life, trying to find that one thing that will satisfy her soul. He says, you've been looking for it in all the wrong places. Come to me, and I will give you that living water. 
because I am the source of that living water. And then Jesus echoes that same teaching in John chapter 7 when he says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. And so with these two passages from John chapter 4 and John chapter 7 as sort of a backdrop, if we have those in our minds, then we get to the cross and Jesus says again, I am thirsty. And we can't help but wonder and ask, you know, what does it mean that the one who offers us living water is now himself thirsty. Can you feel the intensity of the moment now? With these words of Jesus, we can almost feel the source of living water drying up. The source of life is dying. Humanity in this moment has chosen to destroy the very spring of water that came to refresh our thirsty, dying souls. And so with all of that as sort of the teachable backdrop to what's taking place, what do we do with that? As we think about these deeper meanings to Jesus' words of thirst, it's important to ask ourselves, what are we thirsting for, first and foremost in our lives? What do we hope will satisfy us? I'm reminded, at least I was reminded this week, of the beautiful words of Psalm 42 as I was thinking about this text, where it says, as a deer longs for flowing streams of water, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God. I mean, these are beautiful words from the Psalms. But let's be honest, they're not always words that we live by, right? I mean, sometimes we seek out people, we seek out things to satisfy our thirst only to find ourselves poorer or worse off than before, and yet still thirsty. Yet as even as misguided as we can become in finding ways to satisfy our thirst in this world, hope still remains. I mean, just listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 41, verse 17. For the prophet says to us, when the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. For I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I mean, we sometimes get hung up on things that we think will bring us satisfaction. And it might for a while, but few things offer us satisfaction for the long haul. Jesus' death on the cross for you and for me summons us to thirst only for Him because He is the living embodiment of the God who will never forsake us and will never leave us thirsting forever. And as we come to the end of this message today, I'd like us to, to land in the last book of the Bible because it offers us a glimpse of something important today. I mean, Jesus Christ, even though He was thirsty in that moment on the cross, He is for us the water source of the river of eternal life. And in the last book of the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, we catch a glimpse 
of the city of God. And it describes Jesus as the source of life-giving water. This is from Revelation 22. It says, The river of life-giving water, shining like crystal, flows from the throne of God and the Lamb, Jesus, through the middle of the city's main street. On each side of the river is the tree of life. The tree's leaves are for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. They won't need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will rule forever and always. You know, may we hold on to this glorious vision of Jesus as a sort of signpost of hope for our lives, even as we are also confronted by the darker vision of Jesus thirsting and dying on the cross today. So, may Jesus' words of, I'm thirsty, be this basic reminder that we can't live without water. May we be reminded today that in the age to come, in the city of God that will one day come down from heaven, there is a river of unquenchable love bought for us by the agony and thirst of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But even more than that, May you confess the thirst that it comes from your own soul. May you accept that the things of this world cannot satisfy your soul and will never satisfy your thirst. And then may you come to Jesus, the one who offers living water. And may you find for yourself in Jesus Christ the gift of of love that will never fail and will always satisfy. Amen and amen. And now in response to God's grace and love, let us offer up the gifts of our life and our labor.
Let us now join together in prayer. Holy God, your faithful love surrounds us. We give you thanks for the gift of life, the gift of new life, and for the many ways you sustain and nurture us throughout our lives. In this Lenten season and in this moment, we come before you this day, some of us tired and hungry, longing for your word to sustain us, longing for your spirit to comfort us. Some of us limp into worship bruised and battered and sore, looking for healing, longing for wholeness. Some of us come into worship burdened with despair, wondering what has happened to life, wondering where the joy of life has gone. Some of us come with heavy hearts, praying for young people harmed by those who should protect, praying for those who look different and so are suspect, praying for a world on edge, tense with fear and hate and violence. So God, we come in prayer to you, looking for good news in the midst of the world's bad news. We come to you seeking forgiveness for our wrongs, seeking to know your presence when we feel so alone, seeking to know your heart and will for a world with so much need. Holy God, we offer you our prayers. And we listen for your voice. Holy God, let your grace rain down on us this day. May we be surrounded by your love, your peace, your hope. Open our eyes and our hearts to see you in unexpected places. Guide our hands to show your love in this world. God, in the midst of our joys and concerns, let us be mindful that you are a God of Easter surprise, that you are a God of peace, a God of hope, a God of love. So fill us with your spirit. Satisfy our thirsty souls. Help us to widen our circle of grace until all the world knows your grace and rejoices. For we pray these and all things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may now stand for our closing song of praise.
Brothers and sisters, let us remember this day that Jesus offers not just a drink from a water bottle. He offers us living water, living water that restores our souls, that reminds us that we are beloved children of God. Let us leave with those words on our lips and those words in our hearts this day. And as we go from this place, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, those whom you love, and those who think no one loves them. And next Sunday begins the holiest week of the year. Let us look forward to that wonderful, wonderful celebration. Amen.